Buddha speaks of goodwill as a form of mindfulness, something you have to keep in mind, which means that it's not an innate quality of the mind. If it were innate, you wouldn't have to be mindful. It would just be there, constantly expressing itself. But the fact is the mind has both goodwill and ill will. We have to keep in mind that we want to hold by goodwill all the time. Even when we go through all the Brahma-viharas and get to equanimity. The reason we use equanimity is for the sake of mature goodwill, realizing that there are areas where we'd like to see people do what's skillful and to experience the results of skillful actions, but for one reason or another it's not going to happen. So if you have genuine goodwill for yourself and good for the will for the people that you could be helping otherwise, you have to treat certain things with equanimity. So goodwill is always there as something to keep in mind. And the Buddha also speaks of it as a determination. You have to make up your mind. You're going to stick with it. And here it's good to reflect on his teaching about determination, what's involved in a good determination. First there's discernment. You have to think about what goodwill means. In the cosmos that where things are shaped by action, it means that may people and all beings act on skillful intentions. May they not harm one another. May they understand the causes for true happiness and be willing and able to act on them. In other words, you think of other beings not simply as the recipients of your goodwill, but they're agents. And the fact that you're spreading thoughts of goodwill doesn't mean that you have a magic power to make them happy. You have to reflect on how the principles of karma work. And so you have to focus on the causes. At the same time, you have to reflect on how to maintain a good state of goodwill in the mind. This is where you have to think about the different kinds of fabrication. When you find yourself overwhelmed with thoughts of ill will, you have to stop and ask yourself, how am I breathing? How am I talking to myself about the issue? What, what's wrong with what I'm saying? How can I change what I'm saying to myself? And finally, how can I change my perception of the situation, the feelings that I'm focusing on? In other words, you gain discernment into how to fabricate a state of goodwill, not only when it's easy, but especially when it's hard, because you realize, and this is another aspect of discernment, your motivation for developing goodwill is not based on the idea that we're all one, and there's no question of who deserves and doesn't deserve goodwill. It's something that if you harbor ill will for anybody, you're going to do unskillful things. And so for your own protection, you have to think thoughts of goodwill in all situations. So that's the first aspect of determination, is having discernment about your means, about your motivation, and about the goal that you're aiming at. You want to learn to find a happiness that's totally harmless. And you keep reminding yourself that this is a, a good goal to keep in mind. And the second aspect of determination is truth. You really stick with it. This is where goodwill differs from dedicating merit. With dedicating merit, you're not responsible after the act of determination. In other words, you do something good and you tell yourself, may all beings who want to 
rejoice in the merit I've made. I'm happy to give it to them. Because it's in their rejoicing, their approval of what you've done, that they gain merit. But that's totally up to them. You don't have any responsibilities after that. And John Fuang had a student who could see hungry ghosts. It unnerved her the first time it happened, because they tended to hide out in unexpected places, under stairways, in doorways. And she asked John Fuang how she could turn off her visions of the hungry ghosts. He said, here you're in a position where you can actually help them. Most people can't see them, and when you can't see them, there's no way you can engage with them at all. But here you can see them. And so he told her that the next time she met with the hungry ghost, one asked the hungry ghost what it had done to get in that situation, and then two, dedicate the merit of her practice to it. And so she did. And she found that one by one by one, she was able to get them out of this situation of being a hungry ghost. But then there were some cases where it didn't work. They just stayed right there. She got upset about that. So she went and reported that to a John Fuang. And he told her, look, your duty goes only as far as dedicating your merit. Whether they have the merit to appreciate it and to rejoice, that's their business. That's the dedication of merit. But the spreading of thoughts of goodwill carries further responsibilities. Do you have goodwill for other people? You should act on it. That's what the truth comes in. You really follow through. So when you wish for someone to understand the causes for true happiness and be willing and able to act on them, what can you do in that direction? What can you do to help influence that person to act in ways that are skillful? Very rarely do we think about that. We think, well, maybe I'll do a favor for so-and-so and be nice to them. But goodwill is not just niceness. Goodwill goes into thinking about, how is this person going to fare? How is this person going to be truly happy? Of course, one way of influencing people to pick up skillful activities is to be skillful yourself. In fact, that's probably the best way. You don't go around preaching to people, but if they can see that you're a good example and they think about it, what it means to be a human being. Here's a human being who's kind, generous, virtuous. It might inspire them to be in that way as well. So it's your truthfulness that takes the thought of goodwill and helps to carry it out. Then there's relinquishment. And here's basically here it's a matter of thinking about situations where there's someone you think deserves to suffer. They've acted in unskillful ways, and it seems wrong that they're not meeting up with some sort of misfortune. It seems that justice is not being done. You have to relinquish that. The ideal way for people who've been misbehaving to change their ways is to have them have a change of heart. Now, it may happen that they will meet up with bad karma, but ideally they would be in a position where they had developed thoughts of goodwill themselves, learned to be virtuous themselves, learned to be discerning, develop their minds to the point where they're neither overcome by pleasure nor overcome by pain. That would be the ideal situation, the ideal solution, as in the case of Angulimala. The Buddha can say to Angulimala, okay, come back after you've reaped the rewards of having killed so many people, and then we'll talk. He saw that Angulimala had the potential. Now, there were a lot of people who were upset by the fact that Angulimala became a monk and he was not going to be punished. You throw things at him. 
And when we hear the story, we usually identify with Angulimala, but many times in our daily life, we're actually playing the role of the people who throw things. So I'd like to see so-and-so get his just desserts and get some satisfaction out of that. That's something you've got to relinquish if you're going to have goodwill, and have goodwill all around. Otherwise, how are you going to get in and help that person? That's the third quality. The fourth is calm. Goodwill is often a calming thought, but in those cases where you have to give up your ideas of wanting to see justice done, you have to calm your mind down. And here's where all the factors of a, of a skillful determination come in. You have to use your discernment to remind yourself if karma plays out. You don't have to be an agent. You don't have to be the avenging angel, because avenging angels tend to be avenging demons. And if it so happens that that person does change his or her ways, then you have to be happy for them. So you have to calm the mind down. Think in a much larger perspective. That it's good for the world that people change their ways without necessarily having to suffer. So when we think of goodwill as something you get, something that you have to be mindful of. And that mindfulness is something you have to be determined to stick with. It changes the relationship. It's not a matter of digging down and looking for your innately good nature. As the Buddha said, it's also a form of restraint. You have lots of impulses that go against goodwill. And you can have lots of good reasons, you think, for having ill will for a person. In fact, you can dress it up so it's not ill will, it's your idea of justice. So there's a lot in the mind that has to be fought, and that requires a lot of determination. But it's good in the long term. If you think about those people who threw things at Angulimala, that became pretty heavy karma on their part. Their de desire for justice was going to backfire on them. You don't want to be in that position. You want to get out of this whole back and forth. And you think of goodwill as an escape in that way. That helps you get out of the back and forth. Then it's easier to stick with it. So bring some discernment to your practice of goodwill, some truth, some relinquishment, and some calm. And you'll find that it changes your relationship to the whole idea of what's a good way to live in the world. And you develop an attitude that's a lot more mature. <laughs>